Rosemary Wong is a developer advocate with HashiCorp. She's also the author of Essential Infrastructure as Code, Patterns and Practices, published by Manning. I have her on the show today to talk about her book and Infrastructure as Code in general. We talk a little bit about developer advocacy. It really was a great conversation. I just enjoyed talking to Rosemary so much. So uh, check it out. Before we get there, as always, a reminder that streaming audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer. That's developer.confluent.io. If you want to get started learning Kafka, KSQL DB, Confluent Cloud, there are video courses. There's a library of event-driven architecture patterns. Uh, there are executable tutorials, long form explainer pieces, all kinds of educational content, everything you need to get started. So check it out. When you sign up for Confluent Cloud for the first time to do exercises there, use the code PODCAST100. You'll get an extra $100 of free usage. Definitely worth it. Developer.confluent.io. And now let's talk to Rosemary. Hello and welcome to another episode of Streaming Audio. I am your host, Tim Berglund, and I'm joined on the podcast today by uh, HashiCorp developer advocate and author of Essential Infrastructure as Code, Rosemary Wong. Rosemary, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Tim. I got the title right, didn't I? Yes, you did. Okay, I was saying it, and I was like, wait, am I saying the right time? That's what I think it's usually, you know, folks get a little bit, they reverse it, you know, something blank of blank, and uh, yeah. I, I don't mind either way, but I thought it made sense. Good, good, okay. Yeah, um, yeah so you have a book in Early Access uh, by Manning, and I'd like to talk about the book today, and um, I'd like to talk about what you do at HashiCorp also, if we could dig into that, if we have time. Yes. Um, and really just this idea of infrastructure as code. I mean, this is a nominally a Kafka podcast. Uh, Kafka is, I, I, I Googled this before we started recording. Kafka is infrastructure. It uh, is. I 100% checked and it turns out that it is. So I don't know, this seems relevant. So um, yeah, talk to us. What When you say infrastructure as code, what do you mean? And uh, let's just go from there. Of course. So. It's been interesting to hear about the evolution of infrastructure as code. Some people uh, consider infrastructure as code, uh, not purely infrastructure as code. You'll also hear infrastructure as software, uh, infrastructure as configuration. But for me, I group all of the all of the ideas behind infrastructure as code as a set of practices that align with software development practices. But you apply them to infrastructure, or to specifically infrastructure, which broad definition for a lot of things. As you pointed out, Kafka is infrastructure. And I think what's very interesting about applying infrastructure as code, right? Trying to use software development practices like version control, continuous integration, delivery, deployment even, it's challenging. It's a heuristic. It's not 100% perfect in infrastructure. And so the result is that when we try to make the theoretical application work in infrastructure, we kind of get a little confused. It breaks down a little bit. Uh, and so what I wanted to understand was what are the ways that we can apply these practices and be practical about them, right? We can't apply everything. So how do they work in infrastructure specifically? I like it. Um, and I think you, struggling with the name, people say infrastructure as software, or infrastructure as code. I've been trying to champion infrastructure as YAML, and I'm not getting any uptake on that. I don't really understand what the problem is, but um, you know, and I, I, we, we laugh, I laugh a lot because people love to judge the domain specific language, right? right. Kubernetes is a big uh, technology that, that a lot of folks are talking about in the industry. And there's a and, lot of YAML there. Yeah. And there's a lot of YAML, but I came from networking and, and that had a lot of YAML too. Uh, there was none of, you know, and I, I laugh a little bit because at the end of the day, whether you're using a domain specific language and it ends up being a markup language like YAML, or you're using a programming language, at the end of the day, the practices to collaborate, organize, and make sure you're doing it securely are the same. Right. Yes, there are some technical differences, but you have to still collaborate and scale in the same way. And, you know, 15 years ago, it was fashionable to hate XML. Now it's fashionable to hate YAML. I'm excited to learn in 15 years what it will be fashionable to hate then, um, and we'll still get good things done. So. You you said applying software development practices to infrastructure. 
And uh, I have an idea what you might mean by that, but go into detail there. What, uh, what, what practices? Sure. I think the main ones are version control. Uh, this one, I think people can take to an extreme in, in the infrastructure space as GitOps, right? The idea of making your changes through version control, the reason why you would do this is because you're trying to audit and track changes. You're trying to control the kind of collaboration that are go that would make configuration changes in your infrastructure. You know, previously, whenever I would make changes to any kind of a system, I would put in a change ticket and someone would try to figure out if it conflicted with something else. And I would wait and see after I applied it whether or not it worked. And sometimes it went well. Uh, at worst, I didn't know if it broke something until three weeks later. And so the uh, the idea with applying some of these software development practices is saying, okay, let's add testing to this workflow. Let's try to build a way that we organize the infrastructure changes and understand what's happening before they go to production. Let's build security in earlier into our systems rather than waiting until after we've gone to production and our security team says that this practice isn't great and we should probably go back and secure it. There are a lot of other factors in software development um, including continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. Uh, that's particularly challenging in the infrastructure change realm, right? Do you have a change advisory board if you automatically deploy everything to production uh, with good testing, right? So there are many, many more. So the book goes through a whole series of these from how do you write it, um, applying clean code practices and applying... Oh. Yeah, I, I had to go back and dust off my uh, software design patterns book for it a bit. Uh, and I, I laughed. I was like, I promise it's not as dense. My hope is that it's not as dense as the design patterns book. And it's applied and scoped to how you write infrastructure in particular. So modularizing dependency management. Uh, we go through, there's a chapter that's upcoming on security. And there will be a chapter on cost, which is the one I'm most scared to write. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're progressing through all of these different practices uh, in software that we consider, but we don't necessarily talk about with our team very early on. Wow. So um, this sounds, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I think I'm famously not an ops guy uh, and in, in contemporary terms, not a DevOps person. No one mistakes me for that. That's not the kind of stuff I normally talk about. It's not where I spent my time. Um, and so it would certainly be possible for me not to have my finger on the pulse of things here, but I don't hear other people talking like this. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm the, the question I'm about to ask sounds like I'm hundred percent asking you to toot your own horn, but go ahead, do it. Is this a fairly fresh and new approach? Is there a movement that you're participating in or are you really kind of saying, Hey folks, let's, you know, you follow me here are some new ideas. There are other resources on infrastructure as code, and some folks have borrowed the language of software development practices and applied it and talked okay. about it in great detail. But what I realized was that we weren't talking about it from a big picture view. A lot of these books, if you were coming from the development space, which is what I am an aspiring, I always laugh, I'm an aspiring software developer because I can never get it right. And I, no matter how many times I paired with some fantastic senior developers, principal developers, in various languages, it's not an intuition that I immediately developed. Mm -hmm. And so what I wanted to try to figure out was if we're talking a lot about dev and ops, and here we are trying to apply, to apply development practices to operations, we should try to speak about the software development theories, but in an infrastructure specific way. And that gap was really hard for me to fill when I was learning uh, and applying Try, you know, applying some of the stuff I was learning in the software development space as someone who is operational. I wanted to improve my automation. I knew my automation that I was doing, like scripts, uh, you know, configuration management, it was brittle. I couldn't change it that easily. It wasn't very modular. I couldn't easily share it with my teammates. And I knew there had to be something better that I should be doing. And so trying to understand and draw upon the theories and applying them to infrastructure really helped me. So my hope basically was that if I wrote this, um, it would find a common language for development teams to understand this if they're picking up operations, but, but also operations teams trying to fit this into a development life cycle. I like it a lot. It, it feels like another one of these things 
Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm blatantly promoting your book here. Everybody, you should probably read Rosemary's book if you operate <laughs> things at all. But I mean, that's my take so far. But um, it, it, it feels like one of these things where you know we started. I don't know. Ten years ago, there was Chef and Puppet going on, and there were there were files uh, in in Git repos and maybe even on GitHub. Um, and like that was all a thing. Uh, and maybe the more doctrinaire you mentioned GitOps, the more doctrinaire GitOps kind of thing is. Well, if the pull request gets merged, then it it's it happens. You know, there's a hook and do it. Um, and that's cool. Like there's there's a all kinds of good things about that. But it it feels like. Um, you know, when, when DevOps started to become a word and I'm, I almost hate to use that word because now people are just going to fight about what DevOps means, but just, you know, this, this movement, uh, that we're, we're talking about here, the software development principles that were in use there were source control. And that's what you started by saying like, well, yeah, okay. Now my infrastructure is described in a text file and, uh, that's in a Git, a Git repo. And there's a button I can push that turns that text file into, into infrastructure. And maybe that button is actually like a bunch of levers and knobs and a bunch, you know, maybe it's not really just a button. Uh, but that's the principle is code is a text file. I put code in a Git repo. And now I describe my infrastructure with a text file and I put that infrastructure in a Git repo. And um, that's very good. I mean, that, that was a sea change right there. And that's a software development principle applied to infrastructure. But it kind of sounds to me like there was a whole bunch of promissory note that was going unpaid. And you're trying to say, hey, wait a second, you know, all this other stuff, being a developer is not just checking source code into a Git repo. There are these other things that you do. Uh, and you're trying to say those now apply. Now that we've got the tooling, it's ubiquitous, the moving targets, you know, you've got different tools coming and going and it's YAML or it's it's a Ruby DSL or it's whatever. Um, but now let's be serious about the fact that we are writing infrastructure code. We're software developers. It's just that the domain isn't insurance or healthcare or retail or manufacturing. The domain is systems. And exactly. like be that all the way. Is that exactly okay? I like that's that. perfect. I, like, I think it's and it. I think what what really got to me was that a, a lot of developers wanted to take it that I met and worked with. They wanted to take advantage of all these managed offerings that were out there. I mean, you could say Kafka as a service is a managed offering, and I mean, people. I'm a huge fan of Kafka yeah, Cloud. Yeah, Just they didn't. I mean, people don't want to take on necessarily the operational aspects, but they still need to take on configuration. They still need to take on how they connect to it as well. Um, and having structure around it and working and and at least distributing this information across your team as well as your security team is very challenging. Uh, this is a book that's like a almost like a crash course of all the development practices that a software developer might have learned uh, while trying to understand microservices, ar architectures, and uh, continuous deployment and just crammed into one book applied to infrastructure, which is challenging, but I hope it helps at least. Yeah, but um, but uh, no, I, that, that sounds like a good way to organize it because all those things can be summarized in a few pages, right? You don't, you don't have to, they're all book length treatments available, but the summary and the introduction is, is just a few pages and then apply to infrastructure. Now, do you, does, do you have uh, this, obviously there, you know, you have examples. So um, where do you go in terms of tooling? Where are you right now that, what, what, what do the examples get written in? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And one that I will acknowledge has been fairly contentious. <laughs> no, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? I uh, can't get it right. So I am, you know, full disclosure, as someone who who works for HashiCorp, uh, I am very familiar with Terraform. I used a lot, you know, in, in engineering. Um, and I've used a, quite a bit of Python as well, oh, okay. uh, and quite a bit of Golang. And so in this book, there were two options, two or three different options that I could entertain. The first was write, figure out how to write my own infrastructure as code syntax. That was neither uh, Terraform nor any other current tool that existed. That sounds like is, a great idea. Yeah, per fantastic idea. And, you know, it provides it. But the problem is that you get folks who say, no, I really want an example. I really want to understand, like, mm -hmm. how this actually applies when I run it and, and try to do this in my real system. 
And so uh, my first iteration, I said, okay, I'll just use Terraform because uh, HashiCorp configuration language, it has its limitations, but it is intent driven, right? So if you read it, there's intent, you can say, oh, this is the resource attribute. This is the resource. You don't need as much knowledge of the direct syntax. You know, the real focus is these are the configurations and these are the yeah. practices. Yeah. I mean, the but, idea is you're describing yeah. a state that you would like to obtain exactly. in the world. Exactly. It's declarative. And so it was, uh, it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's very structured. So I was like, okay. Uh, and, you know, after the first round, some folks were like, we don't want it in Terraform. Um, if it, if syntax changes, you know, this book is not really as relevant. The examples aren't as relevant. So it's very complicated. It is Python. <laughs> uh, yeah, Python. So it's an imperative wrapper, uh, that is around, uh, declarative Terraform JSON, uh, which will eventually, eventually Terraform will pick it up and use imperative Golang. So, you know, uh, it's a declarative sandwich of sorts. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yes. But a kind of it, it, a tool chain for the book, so you have some generalized way of exactly. Yeah, but I mean, exactly. you have to you, you got to make that call at some point. I mean, the original yes. you mentioned uh, design patterns. The original Gang of Four patterns book was C plus plus because Precisely. well, I mean, that was the language that was available and prudent to use. And mm -hmm. you can't just talk about ideas; you have to show code no. at some point. So no, exactly. And I think C plus plus and and reading that book, I I sort of was like I may not know C plus plus to the to the deepest extent, right? That was that was uh, necessary to fully understand it, but I was still able to totally. try to yeah. get a sense of the practices and how I would think about applying it to other languages. And that was my hope for for the examples in this. Book Absolutely, too. yeah. No, back yeah. back, well. I can, I can disclose my age. That's fine. But in, in when that book was new, um, I was never good at C plus plus. I mean, C plus plus was a pretty big language. There was a lot to be good at, but you know, you could kind of fight through it, and that was that was that was easy enough. Um, what um, you mentioned uh, managed services and uh, the the intersection of managed services and uh, infrastructure management or just DevOps. Now, I we were talking before we started recording, just sort of joking that, you know, oh, well, if you use managed services, of course, you don't need, you know, you don't have any operational concerns. And saying that, like, of course, no one would really say that, but you do hear people say that. So um, talk to us about that tension. Like, uh, if I use, let, we'll just go with Confluent Cloud, because, well, that's, this is streaming audio. Um, there's a lot I don't have to operate about Confluent. I, there's a lot I never have to configure, but um, it's not zero. So how does that all fit together in your world, in your mind? I the th There's so many managed offerings now, you're not going to just be using one usually. And, and the problem is if you were using one, it's okay if you weren't necessarily recording that configuration in version or source control. You know, you could maybe go in and create it and then voila, you can use it. Um, and hope that no one goes in and changes it, right? Uh, but the, the reality is that we are choosing a lot of, of infrastructure types. We're choosing you know, manage, a managed service for one thing, and then maybe we're building something, you know, servers on a cloud provider while trying to still communicate to an Oracle database in our data center, right? right. Uh, and as long as we have these more complex topologies, you might need to consider standardizing on an infrastructure as code practice, no matter if it's managed or data center or any other kind of resource. Just because at the end of the day, we are all engineers and we're all looking for uh, the opportunity to learn and grow. And your teams are going to change. Um, your teams are going to shift. Your business domain will shift. Uh, and you need a way to collaborate effectively and communicate some of the knowledge that you have about your infrastructure. It's a little bit like the, um, uh, I joke, it's like a little bit like a, a, a tiny a tiny configuration in hiding, right? Uh, if someone goes in, they make a break glass change, meaning they will go in and make a manual change for the sake of emergency. Uh, and uh, one day they, they switch teams. They no longer have access to that system anymore, but they've made that change. They forgot to log it somewhere. They forgot to tell someone. You roll out a change and all of a sudden your system implodes, right? Yeah. And it's usually the weakest link link in all of these different topologies that you have across multiple infrastructure components. And you yeah. are none the wiser that it exists. 
uh, and you then the next day get to write the outage blog post. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. You get to do the root cause analysis and, and right. everything else. And and uh, I think one of the, the, the things about managed services to understand is that you can create it and someone else can operate it. But if you needed to create a duplicate for some reason or another, especially if you're working in the data in, with data, right? If you want to do something um, more immutable, uh, a strict, you know, a strategy that's more immutable for changing your data infrastructure, for example, uh, you know, blue green, something that's lower risk, because that is important. You want to protect your data. You want to do something a little bit lower risk. You may not want to do something in place. Uh, then infrastructure as code is something that will help you apply it, reproduce it, um, compose it with new changes and evolve it over time without necessarily affecting other parts of your system. And I wanted to ask you about immutability. Um, it strikes me that the kind of the nature and the purpose of your book doesn't seem like it needs to take a position. Uh, and I don't, I can't, I can't necessarily infer from what you're saying about applying software development practices to infrastructure as code, uh, what your position might be. So this is a little bit orthogonal. I'm just kind of curious because I like asking ops people this question, but <laughs> what do you think about immutable infrastructure? Is it a good idea? Is it like you should pursue at almost any cost? Is it where, where are you on that spectrum? I may pursue when you can, but understand you won't do it all the time. Uh, immutable infrastructure is expensive. There are some oh. things that have a expensive in terms of cost and time. Okay. So the like amount engineering, of engineering cost, you, you, a lot of you to yeah. do it. Okay. it even even monet financial too, oh. because immutable infrastructure means you're creating new infrastructure every time. And it doesn't really help you to delete the infrastructure before you create it, uh, recreate it. Got you it. usually run for an intermittent period of time, two environments, duplicates oh, yeah. of each other. So, and depending on how big your environment is, if you're doing this, like you, let's say you have a network, right? And that network supports, you know, a huge Kafka cluster, right? If you decided to do a quote unquote immutable, uh, immutable change, immutable approach to your network, you duplicate that network plus a new Kafka cluster, any higher level resources, and then you run that environment for a certain period of time. And that's, well, increased financial cost too. Seems like zero people would actually do that. <laughs> but yeah, so you're, you're going to have the, the time that you keep the old version up and the number of times PRs get merged and auto deploys exactly. happen because of course that's, we're cool. Um, and so that's, that's going to give you a, like a percentage you could easily be using double the amount of cloud resources. Precisely. In, in yeah. Day. Exactly. On that. Clearly not an ops person, but that is, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and it, there's an engineering cost to it when, when you consider, you know, the, the testing that you need to do, the, the concerns you might have about the differences between a net new environment versus making a change in an update, you know, just an in-place update. So I am, I don't push for immutable infrastructure for everything. I, you know, I think it is important to do it as much as you can, but I also recognize it's not completely possible and it may not be practical. If you're updating a tag on your cloud resource, you might not need to have an immutable uh, copy. You know, you don't need another copy of that server to update a tag. You oh, could no. update it. It's yeah, you could. Exactly. You could update it in place in like 30 <laughs> seconds and that would be fine. So yeah. the world actually I tend is mutable. Yeah, exactly. And that's mutable. So um, I think it's a it's a matter of balancing the two. Uh, and, and I usually do it from a cost, both from engineering effort as well as financial cost kind of view because... Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's that's huge. And stuff like Terraform is, is trying to help you kind of put a tooling layer in there that, that gets you a good part of the way. Um, yeah, exactly. A lot of tools will do it. You know, you can... CloudFormation, for example... Um, you know, any of the other infrastructure as code tooling out there will we'll generally put a layer for you to understand the types of changes that can be done mutably and immutably, right? Someone else made that decision or did that testing for you. You don't have to go and figure out which one is which right, anymore. Right. Um, hey, tell us about what you do at HashiCorp. You are also a developer advocate. Always good to talk to a fellow professional. What do you, uh, yes. what do you focus on there? I focus on console and vault. So console is the service mesh uh, open source tool and vault is the secrets management open source tool. Awesome. So 
you uh, spend your time helping people understand them and think it seems like a good, think it help persuade people that it's a good idea to use them if it solves a problem they have. <laughs> I think it's um it's a little bit funny to me because at the end of the day that both of them are are in some ways a developer story <laughs> more than they are an operations story. Uh, so, it, it, and that's where it's, yeah. it's been. Yeah, we talk a lot yeah. about operations because, in some ways, you know, a lot of the HashiCorp tools focus on infrastructure automation. But console and Vault, more than others, it's a it's a it's effectively a developer story because you know service mesh is in some ways is offering abstractions for observability. Abstra- offering abstractions for traffic management, traffic shaping, like circuit breaking retries. Uh, Vault, uh, yeah. is secrets manager, is offering abstractions for secrets injection. And in both cases, it's an abstraction that takes the functionality away from the application code, right? And in some ways, you can focus the application code on doing the actual application functionality and not necessarily these operational I mean, I say that I I gesture with quotes as I do this, but well, operational pieces. They kind of yeah. If you're not watching the YouTube version, you should watch the YouTube version. You can see Rosemary gesture with quotes. Um, but um, I mean, those are operational concerns. It it makes sense to me that a person like you would would be the one who would handle those, and that they would be under the HashiCorp umbrella, which, like you said, is all heavily ops yeah. and infrastructure focused. Because yeah. um, I mean, yeah, service mess. Sir, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> we that, all know what you think about it now. <laughs> that. <laughs> a little Freudian slip there. Um, service mesh um, is solving. Uh, it, it is infrastructure and it is solving I, what I consider to be largely operational concerns. I think that argu- argument can be made. There's a, there's a continuum there. And hey, mm-hmm. there should be, right? Yeah. It's, it's good that we see that continuum. Yeah, exactly. It, it's a... I, I will. I will say that it's not as it's not as service mesh is hard. I, service mesh is non obvious. Uh, there you can you can generally agree on a definition as like an infrastructure layer uh, that abstracts it abstracts away sort of the 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 networking whatever networking you want to talk about from right. uh, the application side. But is it operational? Is it more development? It, no one can fully agree. Right. No, that's that's a fuzzy boundary, and uh, again, it's appropriate to I think that that some of our tooling and some of our attention is like consciously in that fuzzy boundary between those two places. Yeah, this I guess we're going to uh, get many comments about DevOps again, but oh, good. I guess yeah. that's it. <laughs> in the comments, tell us what DevOps means. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. We'll be there. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, hey everybody, if you listen. Uh, past the end, I'll have a discount code for uh, Rosemary's book. It sounds like uh, if this is a thing that you do, it sounds like a really good book. I would encourage everybody to read it. And uh, my guest today has been Rosemary Wong. Rosemary, thanks for being a part of Streaming Audio. Thank you for having me. And there you have it. If you're still listening, you get a special discount code for sticking with us all the way to the end. You can use the code PODCON19, that's P-O-D-C-O-N-1-9, to get 40% off all Manning publications in all formats. Just enter PODCON19 during checkout on manning.com, and that 40% off is all yours. Enjoy it. And don't forget to check out Confluent Developer, that's developer.confluent.io, to get started learning Apache Kafka. If you take a free video course on Confluent Developer and sign up to do exercises in Confluent Cloud, you can use the code PODCAST100 to get an extra $100 in free usage. So I hope this podcast was useful to you. And if you want to discuss it more or ask a question, you can always reach out to me on Twitter at TLBerglund. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on the YouTube video or reach out to us in community Slack or in the community forum. There's a sign-up link and a link to the forum in the show notes if you'd like to join. And while you're at it, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and to this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. If you subscribe through Apple Podcasts, please be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover the podcast, which we think is a good thing. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you next time.